This isn't a game. Hello y'all, this is Louie and welcome back to Retrosaurus. Now this is a topic I've been wanting to make an episode about since I started the series. As games are now made with more global market minded approaches, we don't run into as many changes to their core identities as we did in the 90s and even the 2000s. It wasn't uncommon for Japanese media to feature heavy localizations or edits that stripped out what was considered questionable, confusing, or otherwise unwanted content when adapted for western audiences. One of the earliest examples I can even think of from my childhood is Brock's infamous jelly donut line from the heavily localized Pokemon anime. Even as a kid I knew those weren't donuts, but it makes me wonder how many adults nowadays are still unaware of Onigiri. But that was the norm for so long that western localizations of Japanese anime and games took on their own identities of sorts and became ingrained in our cultures. That is the point of localizations after all, make content easily consumable for audiences and assimilate it into the culture. It is just a bit disappointing that we missed out on what could have been interesting bits of cultural exchange because the older generation of game developers and localizers didn't think that we could identify with something foreign. Maybe they weren't wrong? Who knows? Regrettably, this mindset is what led to over-localization to strip away so much flavor and context from games. But there are some very good localizations and then some downright terrible ones, with the Yakuza series notably having several examples of both in its library. Localizations are a necessary evil, as literal and completely direct translations simply do not work in most contexts without having to put an asterisk on every word like a pretentious fan sub that refuses to put plan in the subtitles but will waste space on the same screen to explain what keikaku means. But today I want to focus on the ones in the middle, the questionable half-assed localizations that left in just enough of the original's content that altered its identity compared to its source material. We also will define and examine the edits made to the game and if they fall into censorship territory. To really get a proper understanding of this concept of strange localizations, we'll be looking at one of my favorite games that best embodies it, Clock Tower 2 The Struggle Within, aka Ghost Head. To keep the Japanese and English versions distinct throughout the video, Ghost Head will refer to the Japanese version, while The Struggle Within will refer to the English version. So join me as we take a trip to the oddly traditional Japanese inspired land of, um, Salinas, California. Just a quick warning for y'all before we go any further, but there will be spoilers for the entirety of Clock Tower 2 The Struggle Within. But you were never going to play it anyway, were you? Although we have never covered the Clock Tower series proper in Retrosaurus, we have explored the basics in the Haunting Ground episode, as that game is a spiritual successor to this franchise. However, I will give a brief rundown of Clock Tower, as Ghost Head differs greatly from other entries in the series in some regards. But let's be honest here, I'll probably ramble on for way longer than necessary, but that's what you're here for, right? Right? Clock Tower is a point and click adventure horror series that began its life on the Super Famicom, aka the Super NES. Although the first title never left Japan, each subsequent sequel would be released in the West, although the titles of Clock Tower 2 and Ghost Head would be changed to keep players from wondering if they were missing out on another great game, and sadly they were. Clock Tower 1 and 2 followed the story of Jennifer Connolly inspired orphan aptly named Jennifer and her run ins with Scissorman Bobby and his orphan meat covered brother Dan. Following Ghost Head, Capcom co-developed Clock Tower 3, which followed the story of Alyssa. Not this one. Not that one. Not this one either. This one. As she awakened to her ruder powers in her fight against the subordinates of Lord Burroughs. And for Hex and Jekylls, the original director of the series would go on to create the unintentional meme fodder known as Nightcry, which was intended to be more of an official spiritual successor, but ultimately proved to be a wash. It is terrible. But honestly, go play it as the death scenes are hilariously campy and cheesy and I live for that stuff despite my slowly worsening lactose intolerance. Now very few games in the series have received any heavy edits or poor localizations save for Ghost Head. Clock Tower 1 remains a Japan only exclusive and Clock Tower 2 features English voice work in every version of the game. You could argue that Clock Tower 3 was affected by poor localization due to the quality and delivery of the voice acting, but honestly the English version merely leaned into the campiness that was already present present in the Japanese version, and that's what's really making it worth playing. Otherwise it's a fairly bog standard Capcom action game. Look, another episode where we talk about Capcom. I just cannot get away from this company. Someone please help me send help. Now before we go any deeper into the topic, we need to define the terms we will be using. As some may seem synonymous, but there are certain nuances that differentiate them from each other. The major terms we will be using today are translation, localization, edit, 
and censor, and by extension, censorship. Now, for many people, they may consider any changes made to a piece of art or media to be censorship and terrible, full stop, no questions asked. We're not here to debate for or against that specifically, as that is a whole nother rabbit hole of arguing that I will reserve for another time. I will try to keep the definitions as objective as possible, but once we move into the game itself, things will become a bit more subjective as it's hard to remove personal feelings from such discussions. I will be splitting our four terms into pairs, the first being translation and localization, and the second, edit and censorship. Tensor. Now our first pair may seem like they are the same thing, and in a sense they kind of are. But in actuality, they describe very different methods of taking something from one language or culture to another. Translation is defined as rendering from one language to another, or similarly, from one medium to another. You may hear that a film adaptation of a book perfectly translates the feeling of the source material. We will be using this broader definition today as they are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Translation typically is the first step before any localization can happen. I say typically as sometimes we get localized versions of things that have little to no relation to the source material. Narratives and scripts need to be translated from one language to another to get the raw understanding of what is being expressed. Some people prefer this rough conversion in subtitled media as they believe it retains the original feeling without being tainted or changed by the translator's personal flavor. This is where we get half translations and overuse of non-native words to try to retain some of the identity of the source language. But it really makes my kokoro a skosh kanashi to see my tobodachi be so meiwaku about this stuff. Be genki nakama. Localization is generally the second part of the translation process. We are defining it as the process where the source material is altered to better conform or adapt to the target language or culture. It's the process where the translation is adapted to feel more natural for the target audience. A very basic example of this comes from names. In English, names are typically ordered as first name, middle name, surname. In Japanese, it's the opposite, where the surname comes before the first name. So it's not all that uncommon to see games or anime swap the name order to make it clear for English-speaking audiences as they may be unfamiliar with what is and what is not a Japanese surname. Oddly enough though, this doesn't really happen in reverse, as most media in Japan renders foreign names in a different character set entirely, but occasionally you may write your name western style on official documents for clarity. Localization is not something that is inherently negative, and I have to stress that, but it has the potential to completely remove all the flavor and deeper meanings that existed in the original version. To put it into an easy to understand example, I used the Japanese word genki earlier, which actually does not have a singular translation as it's wholly contextual. If you leave it as is, it sticks out like a sore thumb to a non-Japanese speaker and it would make it hard to understand. If you translate it to the direct translation, it would only mean healthy, but it often can mean a variety of things such as fine, lively, strong, or well. Now all of those words have a similar feel, but if someone asked me, o genki desu ka? meaning, how are you? In a greeting context, they most likely are not asking me if I'm strong, but it would be really nice if they did because I got muscles for days and I'm looking for a new swole mate. Our next pair is Edit and Censor, which similarly to our previous pair have the potential to mean the same thing but often are mutually exclusive terms. These words are used to describe changes made to something for one reason or another. The intent, scope, and result of the editing process can easily cross into censorship territory. All censorship is an edit, but not every edit is censorship. At its core, Edit simply means to alter, adapt, or refine, especially to bring about conformity to a standard or to suit a particular purpose. Basically any change made to something to fit a specific situation are edits. On its own, there is no negative context as nearly all media is edited in some form or another to improve the final product. Movies are edited for length, narratives are edited for flow, and even the script for Retrosaurus is edited for spelling errors and missed commas. Does anyone even know how to use commas properly? The intent behind the editing process is what makes them innocuous and necessary or intentional or unintentional censorship. Censor inherently carries a negative meaning compared to edit, though it can occasionally have more of a neutral feel depending on the context. To censor something is to examine in order to suppress or delete anything considered objectionable. Censorship in the context of games can come in the form of removing gore and blood, such as the Super NES, I'm not calling it the SNES, it's wrong, you cannot make me, version of Mortal Kombat, while the Genesis slash Mega Drive version saw little to no changes. Censorship in games was far more common in the 90s, as the medium was still young and seen as an extension of toys, 
rather than its own thing. So even games marketed or intended for older or more mature audiences would see censorship for content as games were deemed childish, at least on consoles. It wasn't until around a decade ago that censoring games became less and less common. Though it seems as if Sony is trying to revive these dark ages with region-specific censoring or bans of certain games. The line between editing and censoring something can be a bit blurry at times, and it's not rare to see people throw claims of censorship for literally any changes made to anything they love. It is important to remember the intent of the edit before making these claims, as I do feel it is more important than the result. Additionally, it's important to keep in mind where the edit is taking place, as different cultures have different standards. Keeping these four definitions in mind, let's dig deeper into the struggle within and see how they affected its translation from Japanese to English and created a new, unique identity in the localization process. Now that we got that out of the way, let's dive into the main topic of this here episode. As the first two entries in the Clock Tower series were helmed by series creator Hifumi Kono, they both share his vision and interest in Western horror films and culture. The first game to be brought over for Western audiences would be renamed from Clock Tower 2 to simply Clock Tower and did not see many if any edits to the narrative, as the Norwegian and English settings in the narrative would feel familiar to players. Sadly, Kono felt that he had hit a dead end after wrapping up Jennifer's story in this title. Thus, directorship was handed over to Yutaka Hirata, whose vision was a marked departure from what the series was known for. This is what led to many changes for the follow-up, further being expressed in the game's name. Instead of being Clock Tower 3, the subtitle Ghost Head was chosen. Honestly, I don't care much for this subtitle as it feels like random English thrown in for flavor, which honestly isn't very uncommon for Japanese games to have, nor does it really reflect the game's feeling properly. If you've seen any of the game at all, you'd understand that the English subtitle, The Struggle Within, more accurately portrays this game, as you will be at constant odds with yourself and question your own sanity as to why you are still playing this game. Unlike every other title in the series before and after it, Ghost Head is set in Osaka, Japan, and features Japanese characters with Japanese names set in Japanese environments to give the game a more distinct Japanese feel. Even after the localization team had their shot at it, there were still so many remnants of the original vision left that the change in locale is not properly reflected. In fact, it's very reminiscent of the sweeping changes that would be applied to the Ace Attorney series when it was adapted for Western audiences. Similarly, that series shifted from Japan to California in an odd, alternate universe where anti-Japanese sentiment and laws never existed, leading to the version of California that we see that was heavily influenced by traditional Japanese culture. The English localization of this game features many changes to the script as the team was worried that the heavily Japanese setting and concepts would bewilder English-speaking audiences. To remedy this issue, the localization team started by changing the setting to Salinas, California. You'd assume if you're going to go out of your way to change things to make it more palatable for an English-speaking audience, you'd make sure to translate everything in the game and maybe even change up some of the set pieces to reflect it, right? Well, thankfully the game didn't see that harsh of edits, as none of the visible Japanese in the game has been changed. Each of the three locations the game takes place in are distinctly Japanese in design. The opening video of the game even features the Japanese train station name on it in the English version. From a visual perspective, nothing was altered during the localization from Japanese to English, aside from subtitles that accompany the dialogue and item names. So if nothing was changed visually, where are all these edits? Now if you're new to me and the channel, let me give a scotch of background about myself as it does grant me some insight on this topic. I lived in a rural Japanese town for a scotch over four years while teaching English, so I'm familiar with Japanese culture, language, and art to a certain degree. Am I an expert? Well, let's just say yes because I really need that boost today. We've already mentioned the change in locale, thus the story and characters would be altered to reflect the new setting. The localization team anglicized each character name, tweaking the script as needed, as a simple one-to-one -one translation or semi-translation would leave the players out of the loop. Our protagonist was renamed from Yu to Alyssa, and her alter ego was renamed from Sho to Mr. Bates. I have a theory on why Sho's name was changed, which does include his voice acting, but we'll get on that later. Additionally, each of her cousins were renamed. Akio became Ashley, a 13-year-old middle school student who fell to pieces. Chinatsu became Stephanie, a 7-year-old wielding a knife with a maniacal laugh. And Masaharu became Michael, a 15-year-old samurai enthusiast, which, let's be honest, given the new setting, makes him a weeaboo. Now, all their English names have absolutely no common theme as they are just common American names. 
But it does remind me, what is it with Japanese horror games and using Alyssa and Alessa for female characters? Moving on, I mentioned the Japanese names and their kanji because there is a thematic connection between Yu and Sho as well as the four children. The name Yu is written with this kanji, which means gentleness, which makes sense as she is the passive gentle personality. Sho, who is the ghostly or otherwise spectral persona, is written with this kanji, which is often found in compounds and words associated with spirits. Akiyo, Shinatsu, and Masaharu each have a kanji in their name that is associated with a season, autumn, summer, and spring, respectively. This leaves us with just one season left, winter. We learn at the end of the game that Yu's birth name is Rin, also known as Lin in the English version, so that actually was an accurate translation, which is written with this kanji, which means cold. Fan theories have suggested that, although it's not exactly the same word for winter, which is Fuyu, it fits the theme of her cousin's names and implies that even though they are not blood related, they still have a strong familial bond. Had the names remained untranslated, I can't imagine many players would have made this connection, as it requires understanding of Japanese past basic and into the point of knowing kanji to make these connections. I just wish they were able to make a similar theme with English names to subtly express these bonds. Oh god, and I called Michael the weeaboo. With the setting and the names having gone through the localizinator, the narrative was next in line. These changes imply a different setup to the story itself, with the premise being adapted enough to retain a similar feel, but not exactly what was intended. Unfortunately, I do not personally have any access to the literature that came with the struggle within, but thankfully fellow Ghost Head speedrunner and the world record holder for NDNA, Paasama was able to provide me with the information I was looking for. Up until around the midpoint of the 360 generation, games used to come with paper manuals that would extrapolate the settings, characters, and other necessary information about the game you were playing. Sometimes this would be a simple one paragraph or one page synopsis of the game. Even older games shoved a bulk of the narrative and even a guide of sorts into their manuals that made them integral to playing the game. In the case of Ghost Head and The Struggle Within, we're given a brief description of Alyssa's story before she enters the Tate House. Now this may seem like another pointless factoid to point out, but it really highlights what was lost in translation in this one aspect, so stick with me here. The English version's premise is very simple, not that the game was particularly deep in the original Japanese, yet they somehow simplified it down for a reason I've just recently theorized that may shed some light on it. According to the booklet in The Struggle Within, the game begins one month following an incident where Alyssa unknowingly stabbed an unmentioned amount of friends with a knife with no recollection of what happened. As she has no memory of the event, she is presumed to be possessed by an entity known as Mr. Bates at that time. Sometime after, she realized the strange amulet of no origin that she carries has something to do with keeping that entity at bay. Following the stabbing, she was forced to undergo intense therapy, which somehow only lasted a single month or less. It's assumed the game takes place sometime after her release as she heads to Salinas, California to visit her father's friend and adoptive uncle, Philip Tate. I mean, this scenario is simple enough, it provides enough context for the story, but it does leave out the information that isn't even touched upon in the game's narrative, leaving plot holes and questions as to why if any of this happens, and who even is Mr. Bates? The Japanese version's manual isn't particularly more detailed, but there is another bit of media that released alongside Ghosthead that filled in the backstory of Yu and Sho. An audio drama CD bearing the same name served as a prequel of sorts to the game. It was not uncommon for games to have audio drama tie-ins back then in Japan, and you can still find some nowadays for niche titles. Now, the basic premise of Yu stabbing classmates and receiving treatment following the traumatic incident still exists. However, unlike in The Struggle Within, we are given context to how and why this occurred. During Yu's childhood, her cruel alter ego Sho manifested himself, leaving Yu with no memory of any time she was possessed. Shortly after Sho first took control, her father bought her the protective talisman she carries from a shrine to keep Sho from resurfacing. This is where the character switching mechanic in the game originates, actually. As long as Yu keeps the talisman on her person, Sho cannot awaken and take control. Spring forward about a decade or so, and we find her in high school, an unfortunate victim of bullying. During an altercation with three classmates, the talisman fell off and Sho took control control, viciously stabbing the three students and one teacher to death in order to protect you. The story in both versions mentions the Maxwell slash Seidel curse that causes a pair of cursed twins to be born every few generations. We learn that Alyssa slash Yu is actually one of these cursed children, leading us to assume Bates slash Sho is the other, though if there is a significant reason for their gender to not match the curse, it is never stated. We merely assume Bates slash Sho is male due to the voice acting and a mechanic in the game where he will only enter the men's room while Alyssa slash Yu will only enter the women's room. Aside from the localization team choosing to set the game in the United States, we're kind of left wondering why they changed so much of the premise of the game. 
Now, if you remember, or possibly don't if you're on the younger side or not an American, but video games were still finding their footing and were often the target of scrutiny and outrage for depictions of violence in the 90s. As games were seen as an extension of toys and not a distinct medium like films, even games targeted and developed for older audiences were still attacked as games were still viewed as being only for children in the American cultural zeitgeist. Many games were edited and censored during this time, with Mortal Kombat, like I said, removing blood and fatalities in the Super NES version, and being part of the reason the ESRB was established. Nintendo in general famously forced edits and censorship in many titles on their systems during this time, with religious references and adult themes being stripped out or reworked to be innocuous. This may be part of the reason the original Clock Tower never left Japan. Even with the rise of the PlayStation being more of a bastion of free expression comparatively, edits and censorship would still occur in the games on the platform. So looking back at Ghost Head and cultural reasons aside, I've become fixated on the event that happened one month prior to the start of the game. I've mentioned the difference between Ghost Head and the struggle within's preludes, which is the way Mr. Bates took control and left Alyssa's classmates assumed to be at least critically wounded. While the Japanese version of the game came out in March 1998, the localization didn't hit American stores until October 1999. Conversely, it took less than a year for its predecessor to be translated and released outside of Japan. Now, this is just a theory I've been kicking around in my head, but I think this may have influenced the vagueness of the struggle within's premise in the booklet and the lack of a localization of the prequel audio drama due to the setting and the events that transpired. The Columbine Massacre occurred on October 20th, 1999, leaving 12 students and one teacher dead, 24 more injured in addition to the two perpetrators dying of suicide. Following this, information came out that the motive may have been at least partially instigated by bullying and media focus on the duo's interest in video games. Video games were often the scapegoat of making sense of violent incidents, and sadly that has never really stopped being the case, though it has become less common as of late. Due to the premise of the game having similar parallels to the shooting and a longer than usual localization time compared to the previous game, I can't help but wonder if these events affected the localization team's decisions. With video games under the ever watchful eye of the culture, removing references to bullying, multiple homicide, and the school setting would be in their best interest to keep the game from attracting the wrong kind of attention in an already tense cultural mood. Like I said, it's merely a theory I've considered, but there isn't any hard evidence to back it up, as there aren't any interviews with the team that localized the game about their decisions. But it would explain the need for edits that border on censorship in order to keep the game viable for American players to experience. As we reconsider the translation and editing process, it may have been a necessary evil for the game to undergo such an intense localization with some censorship for it to even exist in English at all. It would explain the reason the game opted for the vague premise and focused more on the Resident Evil inspired plotline of a giant pharmaceutical corporation being the source of strange going ons in the small town of Salinas. The more sci-fi oriented story compared to the previous entries even includes a strange virus that explains the introduction of zombie like enemies. Bache has a much deeper mature voice and gruff personality compared to his Japanese counterpart, though they both share a love for violence and kicking people in the groin. Additionally, the vagueness of Mr. Bates as an entity compared to Sho's familial relation to you alluded to a more sinister, almost horror-like film narrative. In fact, Bates was voiced by none other than Roger L. Jackson, the voice of Ghostface from the film series Scream, which would have been at the height of its popularity during this time. Had it received a more proper, direct localization that kept everything intact, I don't think it would enjoy its status as a cult classic. I can only imagine it would end up like Fatal Frame where its highly Japanese feel kept it from becoming more than a niche series. Though Though Nintendo certainly has not helped the series since they acquired it. Given all the changes and odd design decisions, I'm honestly happy the game exists as it does. It has a unique feel compared to its Japanese counterpart that doesn't negate the original's existence. Though we may have lost some of the charm of the original during the translation process, what we found was a new, unique identity that gives us an insight on the past of modern gaming culture in the localization process. Now that's it for me, thank you so much for watching. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell for alerts for the next episode of Retrosaurus. And if you enjoyed it, don't forget to give me a thumbs up and write a comment below and let me know what your favorite part was. Now this series is brought to you entirely by you lot on Patreon. If you're interested in supporting, there is a link in the description or just search for Kyoto Hunter and you will find me quite easily. Speaking of Kyoto Hunter, you can find me all over the internet at Kyoto Hunter on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, MySpace even, at Kyoto Hunter, which is easier to spell than it is to say. And once again, my name is Louie. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Retrosaurus. See you next time. Well, I guess I've got to get rid of those zombies. It's not gonna be easy.